Hello there, and welcome to part four of our online Bible study series for the Lenten season, brought to you by coronavirus and social distancing. Last time we followed Jesus as he cleared out the temple and was anointed at Bethany and made preparations for the Last Supper. Tonight we're going to read through the Last Supper itself and try to understand its backgrounds and its implications. We'll start in Exodus, at an event which initiated what some would call the Mosaic Covenant. This is when God made a covenant with the Hebrew people, with Moses as the arbitrator. So let's read. Moses rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain, and set up twelve pillars corresponding to the twelve tribes of Israel. He sent the young men of the people of Israel, who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed oxen, as offerings of well-being to the Lord. Moses took half the blood and put it in basins, and half the blood he dashed on against the altar. Moses took the blood and dashed it on the people, and said, This is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you, in accordance with all these words. So keep in mind the words that I've just underlined up there, and I'm sure you can see where this is going. This is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you. Now let's scoot over to the prophetic literature. Jeremiah 31 famously prophesies a new covenant associated with the Messianic age. He says, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with your ancestors when I brought them out of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to one another, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, and for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. So what we've read here in terms of background is first the establishment of the Mosaic Covenant using some words that should be familiar, and then a section from Jeremiah in which a new covenant is promised in which the Lord is going to offer the forgiveness of sins. And this is a covenant which we're about to see the Lord establish here at the Last Supper. Now let's rejoin Jesus at the Last Supper. We're going to go through Luke's version, which contains the most detail. So let's begin. When the hour had come, he sat down with the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, With fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I say, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine again until the kingdom comes. This is, I'll admit, an unclear statement. John's Gospel in chapter 19 informs us that Jesus does indeed take a drink of wine while he's on the cross. So what does Jesus mean when he says he's not going to be drinking of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom comes? There's three solutions that I'm familiar with. The simplest solution is that the sour wine which Jesus received on the cross doesn't count as true wine. Some go as far as to translate it as vinegar. So under this interpretation, he doesn't drink the fruit of the vine in the sense of drinking wine, and thus doesn't contradict what he says here in Luke 22. The next solution looks at the date stamp that Jesus put on when he'd be consuming the wine. He said he would, uh, this would occur in the kingdom of God. So the second solution is to say the kingdom of God was indeed manifest on the cross. Thus Jesus would actually be fulfilling what he'd said the previous night, not contradicting it. This would be the favored solution of people like Scott Hahn. The third, third solution is a bit more subtle. It looks at the actions transpiring at the Last Supper through the crucifixion and conceives of them as one giant liturgical act carried out by Jesus. So when Jesus says at the Last Supper this would be the last time he'd consume wine until the kingdom of God comes, that includes the wine he was given at the cross. That is to say, uh, he'd not consume wine with his friends until all the events of the Passion were over. However you wish to read that is entirely up to you. So let's move on now to the crux of the Last Supper. And he took bread, and gave it and broke it, and giving it to them said, This is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after the supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. What's obvious, based on the background from the Old Testament, which we just went through, is that Jesus is instituting the new covenant which was promised. The question is, what is the nature of the action which Jesus is instituting for the church? The standard answer among evangelicals, in the United States at least, is that Jesus instituted a symbolic meal through which we remember what Jesus did for us. So when Jesus says, this is my body, they understand it like this. 
Imagine I was trying to make a map of my neighborhood using stuff that I had out on a table. And I took an eraser and I said, this is my house. Well, that's clearly symbolic. I'm not actually saying that that's my house in any way, shape, or form, only that it's standing in for my house as a symbol. And that's the sense that they understand Jesus saying, this is my body. However, this is not the historic view held by the vast majority of Christians. Historically, the church has understood Jesus as instituting a sacrificial offering and meal in which his body and blood is made present under the appearances of bread and wine. This is meant to be a New Testament Christian fulfillment of the ancient Passover meal in which the sacrificial lamb was eaten. That is to say, the way you took part in the Passover sacrifice was to consume the lamb. And likewise, the way that you took, take part in the sacrifice of Jesus is to consume his body. Paul reflects on this in 1 Corinthians chapters 10 and 11, saying, The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake in the one bread. And then in chapter 11 he says, Whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself, and so eat of the bread and the drink of the cup. For anyone who eats or, and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. St. John was aware of this. He wrote his gospel for a Christian audience which was already familiar with the Last Supper tradition. So instead, he gave us the following reflection on the consumption of Christ's body in his gospel. In chapter 6, we get the Bread of Life discourse in which Jesus says, This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. Truly I say to you, unless you eat of the flesh of the, of, son of, of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood will have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks on my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the Father has sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread that your fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. And so what we're seeing there is St. John giving a very thinly veiled theological reflection on the Eucharist, which he thought would supplement the Last Supper narrative, which is in the other Gospels. Even the phrase memorial or in memory, which many evangelicals point to as evidence of the merely symbolic meaning of Christ's words of the Last Supper, while it can have the simple meaning of remembering something, it has another sacrificial meaning in this context. If you turn to Leviticus chapter 6 and look at what it says about grain offerings, it describes these, uh, the grain offerings, as the memorial portion. You see the same thing showing up in Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius the centurion, who uh, he's giving to alms to the poor, and the angel says that his alms have been received by the Lord as a memorial. So even that word in memory or memorial is loaded with sacrificial context. Ultimately, this institution of the Lord's Supper as the perpetual oblation of the church around the world in which Jesus is presented to the Father as a memorial offering is to fulfill what is written by the prophet Malachi. He said, My name will be great among the nations. From where the sun rises to where it sets, in every place, incense and a pure offering will be brought to me, because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. And this gets reflected in the historical Christian church from the beginning. So you can see St. Ignatius of Antioch in the year 105. He says of certain heretics, Have nothing to do with them, for they do not confess that the Eucharist is the flesh of our Savior Jesus Christ, who suffered for our sins. Justin Martyr, in writing to the Romans and explaining what Christians do in the year 150 AD, he said, This food is among us called the Eucharist, and not as common bread do we drink it, but in the manner of Jesus Christ, having been made flesh by the word of God. Uh, so likewise, we've been taught this food, which is blessed by the prayer of his word, is the flesh and blood of that Jesus Christ who was made flesh. And Cyril of Jerusalem, in the year 350, also gives a very detailed description of the Mass, in which he describes this, uh, both as a sacrifice and as the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And thus, the original and true Christian understanding of what Jesus did in instituting the Last Supper with the words that we're still discussing 
uh, with the phrase, this is my body, do this in memory of me, was that he was instituting a memorial sacrifice in which he appears under the guise of bread and wine, and we consume him as our Passover lamb. With all that said, let's return to the Last Supper and pick up where we left off. Jesus says, But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me at the table, and truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to question among themselves which of them it was who could do such a thing. Now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them would be considered the greatest. And so he, Jesus, said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them called, are called benefactors. But not so among you. On the contrary, he who is to be the greatest among you, let him also be the younger, and he who governs as the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who sits at table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as one who serves. So this, again, uh, if you've been listening all along, we actually covered this in the first part. Uh, Matthew has this exact same exchange occurring on the way down to Jerusalem. So last time we talked about the principle of servant leadership, uh, so we don't need to rehash that again. So let's keep going. But you are those whom, uh, who have continued with me in my trials, and I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my Father bestowed one upon me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked you, for you, that he may sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny three times that you even know me. All right, so in this final section, let's discuss this now. So it begins with the, with the apostles discussing who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And Jesus says, of course, that the one who's going to be the greatest is the one who's going to serve. Then he goes on to promise that each of the disciples is going to, presumably everyone but Judas, is going to have a, king, a place in the kingdom of God. Namely, they're going to have positions of authority in the church, and as such, they're going to be the servant leaders of the church. So he assures them that they're all going to be great. But then he moves on, and he focuses on a single one who is going to be called upon to serve even the other apostles. He focuses on Simon, and when he says, Satan has asked for you, in English, we don't really have a good second-person plural uh, indicative, what he's really saying is, indeed, Satan has asked for y'all, that he may sift y'all like wheat. But I have prayed for you, in the singular, as he's talking to Peter, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail, and that when you have returned to me, Peter, strengthen your brethren. And so here, Peter is being called to an important role in the church as the one who is going to assist and confirm and serve even the other apostles. This is a promise which uh, was given to him back in Matthew chapter 16, where Jesus said, You are Peter, and on this rock I will found my church, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and earth. Here again, Jesus mentions that he's prayed for Peter, that he might be able to fulfill this role. A role which you also, later on, after the resurrection, you see him receiving that role in uh, John's gospel after the resurrection, where Peter is called aside, and Jesus says to him, Do you love me more than these? Feed my sheep. But unfortunately, Peter has not received the Holy Spirit yet. And so despite his confidence that he is willing to go to death for Jesus, in truth, he's not. And before the night is over, he's going to deny that he ever knew our Lord. See you next time.